If you have ever been on a street corner in America at some point in your life, you probably have heard someone with a megaphone shouting, likely with a New Zealand accent, Jesus died for your sins. This is such a common theology that I bet most non-Christians even think that all Christians believe it. I grew up as a child believing that Jesus died for my sins. Yes, Jesus died for my sin of sneaking an extra piece of candy when I wasn't supposed to. It's all my fault. Sorry, Jesus. But did Jesus really die for your sins? And have Christians always believed this? I'm Mason Menega, and today I'll be talking about if Jesus really died for your sins. Before we jump in, be sure to like and subscribe and turn on notifications. And let me know what you think about the video in the comments. Also, if you like my content, be sure to support me on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Mason Menega. Before talking about if Jesus really died for your sins, I first want to explore a brief history of how Jesus' death has been understood by Christians throughout history. The idea that Jesus' death atoned or made amends for humanity to reconcile humanity with God is called atonement. Or your megachurch pastor, who thinks he's clever, knows it as at one moment. There are many different ways of understanding this atonement that are called atonement theories. One popular one is that Jesus died for your sins. But even though this one is popular, it's not the only way Christians have understood Jesus' death. So let's dive into a brief history of three dominant atonement theories throughout Christian history. Atonement theories obviously begin with our evangelical Lord and Savior, Paul. Despite what you might think, there isn't one particular understanding of atonement that Paul has. There are a lot of different ways you can interpret Paul's understanding of atonement, and that's why most atonement theories would argue they interpret Paul most faithfully. Regardless, there is no mistake that Paul believes Jesus' death has some level of significance to salvation. The first dominant atonement theory was the ransom theory of atonement. Most of the major early church fathers believed in the ransom theory, including Augustine or Augustine, depending on if you're Catholic or Protestant. The ransom theory basically says that Jesus gave himself as a ransom to Satan, but God deceived Satan by making Satan think he had some sort of power over humanity. It's like that bad Mel Gibson movie, but with Mark Wahlberg's brother playing humanity. The next major atonement theory is the satisfaction theory of atonement that was developed by Anselm of Canterbury in the 11th century. Or if you're a progressive Christian, you know him as Asselm. He rejected the ransom view and instead believed that God had been offended and dishonored by the sins of humanity. And these sins deserved divine punishment, but Jesus' death paid the offenses and dishonor of humanity, which satisfied the offense to God's honor so that humanity no longer needed to be punished. It's like when Aslan sacrifices himself to ultimately save Narnia. And I know I didn't need to give a spoiler alert there because literally 100% of you grew up with Chronicles of Narnia. You might be thinking, Mason, maybe it's my evangelical trauma brain, but isn't this actually penal substitution theory of atonement? Your evangelical trauma brain is actually onto something. The satisfaction theory does sound a lot like penal substitution because penal substitution actually derives from the satisfaction theory, but it is slightly different. Several centuries after Anselm, Protestant reformers changed the satisfaction theory a bit by proposing penal substitution which says that Jesus bore the penalty for sin in place of those sinners who believe in Jesus. It also says that God demands punishment for human sin and God also provides God's son to die for this sin. So the big difference between the satisfaction theory and penal substitution is that in the satisfaction theory, Jesus obeyed when humanity should have obeyed and in penal substitution, Jesus was punished when humanity should have been punished. So your evangelical trauma brain isn't far off. Both atonement theories are similar, but there is a slight difference in the emphasis on Jesus' obedience and punishment. And penal substitution is the dominant atonement theory we still hear on street corners and in churches today. It is the Jesus died for your sins atonement theory. And despite evangelicals always thinking their beliefs are historic Christianity, this atonement theory was developed in the 1600s. So it's just a baby atonement theory. So with that brief history of the dominant atonement theories throughout Christian history, let's explore some lesser known atonement theories that I think are better alternatives to the dominant ones and I think better answered the question, did Jesus really die for your sins? Think of them as like hipster atonement theories. They're lesser known, alternative, and better. The first one worth exploring is Christus Victor, 
which just means the victory of Christ in Latin for those who didn't go to an all-white Christian school. While Christus Victor was first proposed by Gustav Allen, he claims his understanding of Christus Victor is actually closer to what the early church fathers believed rather than ransom theory. Rather than Jesus being a ransom to save humanity, Allen says that the early church fathers believed that Jesus' death was a victory over the powers that hold humanity in bondage. Not that kind of bondage. I'm talking about the bondage of sin and evil. I like this way of thinking about atonement more than ransom because it makes Jesus' death less of a business transaction gone bad for Satan and more of a liberation of humanity from the powers of sin and evil. The second alternative atonement theory I think worth exploring is the moral influence theory of atonement. This atonement theory was developed by Peter Abelard in the 11th century during the same time Anselm developed the satisfaction theory of atonement. This atonement theory says that Jesus died as a demonstration of God's love which can change the hearts of humanity to turn back to God. Yet, just like when any theologian makes God out to be loving, Abelard's moral influence theory was condemned and he was eventually excommunicated by the church. The moral influence theory was later expanded on by Fausto Sozzini, whose name sounds like a kind of pasta you can get at Whole Foods. He proposed the moral example theory, where not only did Jesus die as a demonstration of God's love, but his death is also an example to humanity for how we should live. I like these ways of thinking about atonement because they focus on God's love rather than God's wrath. The third and last alternative atonement theory I think worth exploring is a fairly new atonement theory called mimetic theory of atonement. This atonement theory borrows French philosopher René Girard's idea of mimetic theory. Essentially, this atonement theory says that while sacrificial violence has been a part of humanity since the very beginning, Jesus' death on the cross exposes the lie that sacrificial violence works to create peace. So basically, Jesus' death saves humanity from having to continue to sacrifice more victims. It's like an emperor has no clothes situation where sacrificial violence is thought to create peace, but Jesus is like that person that points out that sacrificial violence is butt-ass naked and it saves everyone from having to continue to play into the lie. Maybe Disney could make a movie where John Goodman is Jesus and David Spade is sacrificial violence. Although every character David Spade plays is basically sacrificial violence. Okay, so we've explored major atonement theories throughout Christian history and some better alternatives, but let's circle back to the original question. Did Jesus really die for your sins? While there are some better alternative atonement theories, all atonement theories, whether better or worse ones, still center around Jesus' death saving humanity. But does Jesus' death have to be what saved humanity? Do you even have to have an atonement theory? And do you believe in life after love? Excuse my singing. So atonement theories connect Jesus' death to salvation. So typically, when Christians talk about soteriology, which is a $10 word for theology of salvation, they mean atonement theory. But atonement theory isn't the only way Christians have to think about salvation. So what if our theology of salvation wasn't connected to Jesus' death? And why would that matter? One of my concerns about the idea that Jesus died for your sins, or really any atonement theory for that matter, is that it means that Jesus' death saved humanity. But let's think about Jesus' death literally. Yes, I'm still a biblical literalist. Jesus was a poor brown man who lived under the Roman Empire. He was such a threat to the empire that it publicly executed him. If you have lived in America for, I don't know, the past 247 years, this story may sound familiar. Are there any other poor brown men who lived under empire who were publicly executed that you can think of? Even if new good laws were put in place in response to those men's deaths, does that justify them being killed? I would hope you would say it doesn't. Except, I guess, if you were Nancy Pelosi. Thank you, George Floyd, for sacrificing your life for justice. So if the deaths of other poor brown men living under empire and were publicly executed aren't justifiable, then why would Jesus's? I don't think it's a mistake that one of the core beliefs for many conservative Christians is that Jesus' death, a poor brown man's public execution, was justifiable because it saved humanity, and that belief continues to repeat itself by conservative Christians supporting policies that publicly execute poor brown men to this day. So if you don't want to believe Jesus died for your sins or any other atonement theories, then how should you think about salvation? I think womanist theologian Dolores Williams offers a great way to think about salvation that doesn't connect Jesus' death to salvation. In her incredible book, Sisters in the Wilderness, which you should buy right this second or else Jesus won't die for your sins, Williams talks about Jesus' ministry of transforming the world. 
and humanity being able to participate in this ministry is what saves us, not his death. I think this is a much better way to understand salvation because it doesn't connect it to the public execution of a poor brown man, but rather the transformative work Jesus did in his ministry, which is also work we are invited to participate in, including taking naps on boats. So did Jesus really die for your sins? I don't think so. There have been many ways to think about Jesus' death throughout Christian history, and many of them don't involve Jesus dying for your sins. But even so, I think there are better ways we can think about salvation, and Dolores Williams offers a great way to think about Jesus' ministry as what saves humanity. So now you can go out to every street corner in America with a megaphone and shout at strangers that Jesus ministered for your sins. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe, and also tell me what you thought about it in the comments. This video is brought to you by my Patreon producers. If you'd like to become a Patreon producer, you can find more at patreon.com forward slash Mason Meninga.